I had grown to dislike my first husband so much, <laughs> I regularly felt the compulsion to punch him in the face. <laughs> but I'm not a violent person, so instead I filed for divorce. <laughs> At first I was thrilled to be unattached, unanchored, and independent. Then, one Sunday, the grief arrived, and I geared up for the big cry. Finally, I was ready for a good cleansing from the inside out. This was expected. I'd wasted the better part of my 20s with the wrong guy. I grabbed a box of Kleenex and sat on the bed, the same bed that hadn't seen any sex in over a year, the same bed that seemed too big for one person. I had cozy blankets, a body pillow, and an entire forlorn afternoon to myself. I pulled a few tissues from the box and took a long, slow, shaky breath. But all that escaped my throat was a single, choked sob. Is that it? I waited. My heart palpitated. Yep, that was it. <laughs> I'd failed at marriage, and now I'd failed at crying too. <laughs> I reasoned that I had cried so much during the relationship, I had no more tears to give. A couple months later, at Starbucks, I was innocently grading student essays about the significance of Jay Gatsby's abundance of beautiful shirts. <laughs> I paused for a moment, sipped my iced latte, and noticed this guy holding his hot grande whatever, grinning and staring at me. I gave him a quick, disinterested smile, because I'm a nice person, and he instantly misread the expression as an invitation to a conversation. <laughs> Oh no, I thought as he sauntered over confidently, wearing transition lenses, chunky white New Balance walking shoes, and a wrinkled polo shirt tucked into belted, high-waisted dad jeans. He introduced himself, Elijah. I told him my name and he proceeded to fire off questions. What do you teach? Where do you live? What are those essays about? I answered each one in as few words as possible. Then he said, I don't see a ring. Does this mean you're single? <laughs> uh, I said, stalling. In a quick and shocking escalation of events, he said, will you go out with me? Uh, I said and told him I couldn't because I was just getting out of a relationship. This was technically true, but also a lie. <laughs> I had never let a breakup stop me in the past. Once the guy was gone, I chose a shiny new one to replace him, which either meant I coped well with loss or had enough daddy issues to provide me with a lifetime of looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> How do you know you're not interested, Elijah said and sipped his coffee. You haven't been on a date with me yet. Because it's not you, I'm sorry, it's me, I'm just not interested. This was also the truth, and a lie. <laughs> I was always interested in dating. I could have been interested in Elijah, if he had cooler clothes and, frankly, a better face. <laughs> really, I was ready to move on from my divorce, but I couldn't come out of the gates dating someone who wore New Balance. Then he asked if I was a Christian. That's when I should have said, forget it, it is you. <laughs> Instead, as if I owed him an explanation, I said I was more spiritual than religious. When Elijah started to adamantly defend the Lord, it was the sign I needed to gather my belongings and get the hell out of there. I shook his hand. He held on. Don't make me beg, he said. One date. Was I a horrible person for wanting him to beg? For wanting him to say I was the most beautiful girl he'd ever seen and that he'd never forgive himself if he let me walk away? I loved that someone was talking to me, just not that he was talking to me. <laughs> Come on, he said, one date. Okay, that did technically qualify as begging. It was probably unreasonable for me to think he should get on his knees or climb onto the table and serenade me, although I'd seen it done before. So I cringed 
as the hopeless romantic in me died a little, and I said yes. <laughs> Can I borrow a pen, he said, feeling his chest pocket. <laughs> I suggested he put my number in his phone. He said he didn't have a phone. I was already regretting this. <laughs> he knew I had a pen, so I pulled one from my bag. I didn't want to go out with him, but honestly, I could have used more flattery in my life. Besides, I knew I had been quick to judge others in the past. Good looks and style had always won out over more important qualities like honesty, loyalty, and a personality. This date could be an opportunity to prove myse to myself that I could look beyond the shoes, the receding hairline, the god, and choose a man for his <laughs> strengths rather than reduce him to the weaknesses I perceived. On Saturday night, I arrived at the Summit House for some fine dining. Elijah wore a black polo, basic dad jeans, and the same geriatric footwear he wore the day I said yes. Over our pricey prime rib dinners, Elijah explained his current employment status. I'm student teaching. Having been a student teacher myself once, I knew prime rib was probably out of his budget, but it felt good to be fancy for an evening, and I thought his admiration, what his ambition was admirable, even if he was in his 30s and only just now getting his act together. Then he said, I have Bible study most evenings. My eyes glazed over. Believing in Jesus has changed my life, he said. Oh, I said, drained my wine glass and looked around the dining room for the waiter. Where was he? Elijah scored a point by insisting on paying the bill. Eager to cut the night short, I thanked him, and he walked me to my car. He grew closer to me, putting his hands on my waist. I patted his shoulder, a move I thought would send him to the friend zone for sure. But he swooped in and kissed me. Whoa, that was unexpected. This Jesus freak was a mind-blowingly good kisser. <laughs> when he pulled back, I agreed to a second date almost immediately <laughs> and began mentally scripting our future. On our second date, Elijah talked exclusively about the Bible. I barely listened, holding out for the fun part, a makeout session in my car. I couldn't believe it. Did Elijah and I stand a real chance? Then he said, I want to take you to church with me one Sunday. Now, I wasn't big on Jesus, but I was huge on being wanted, so I agreed to go with him Sunday, <laughs> someday soon. Elijah planted one more kiss on my mouth before leaving and I wistfully watched him and his baggy dad jeans walk away in the dark. <laughs> On the drive home, my mind ping-ponged. Was I too desperate? Did my sucky marriage fuck me up so much that I would willingly trash my core beliefs just to experience passion again? Did I need Jesus in my life? <laughs> A few days later, Elijah invited me out for tacos, a considerable step down from prime rib. Disappointed by the restaurant's chipped formica tables and lack of air conditioning, I fanned myself as sweat dripped between my boobs. I ate my chicken tacos like a delicate lady as salsa splashed from the tortilla to the plate. Occasionally, I dabbed my face and my neck with my napkin, looking forward to my post-taco makeout party with this man who was about to be moved into the official boyfriend zone. <laughs> despite Elijah's faith and my lack of one, despite my actual income and his lack of one, I still wanted him to kiss me. As the sun dipped below the horizon, we sat in his truck, which had about 100 miles to go before it would cost more to fix than it was worth. <laughs> he punched the radio on, and I don't remember the song that spewed out because when he didn't lean in to kiss me, I asked him what was wrong. Staring straight ahead, he said, in the Bible, there is a cautionary tale about Jezebel's manipulating good Christian men and causing them to veer off course. <laughs> it took me a second to realize he meant me. I was the Jezebel in this Bible recap. But instead of telling him to fuck off, the only thing my mouth did was quiver. Here it was, 
the big cry, <laughs> the one that wouldn't come out months ago. I'm on a path, he said, and I can't let anything derail me. I wasn't interested in Elijah's path, yet I cried because I wasn't on it. This was not what I expected, especially since I thought I was the catch in this scenario. If there's one thing I know about my tears, they prefer to show up at the worst time. I was so mad at myself for crying in the first place, I cried more. <laughs> then it occurred to me that Elijah might think I was crying over him, which also made me cry more. <laughs> I'd never even read the story of Jezebel, so how could he blame me for being like her? <laughs> Wasn't I beautiful? Wasn't I worthy? Didn't I wear better shoes than he did? Or was I just a fool ignoring my instincts? I'd been here before, questioning my own standards and worth. I just never thought I'd be back here so soon, and especially not while being kicked to the curb by New Balance in the name of God and by some guy I didn't even like in the ripped cab seat of a beat-up truck outside a shitty taco place on a sweltering summer night. <laughs> I wiped my eyes and pathetically offered Elijah a goodbye hug. He didn't think a hug was a good idea. Probably because if he allowed my boobs to graze his torso, God would smite him and send him straight to hell. As I walked to my car, I looked back in case Elijah had changed his mind, but his jalopy had already left the lot. <laughs> On the drive home, I blasted the radio and sobbed stupidly, wiping my eyes every time the road blurred. I got home and changed into my pajamas. In the bathroom mirror, my eyes were red, mascara streaked, skin blotchy. If I was a Jezebel, I was a hollowed out mess of one, but I had to admit, a nice long cry looked pretty damn good on me. Thank you.